Um, I was thinking a lot about this topic and um, it made me think about a trip to Montreal and I was walking into the hotel, into the lobby, and we sat down and shook hands. And the first question I asked Chris Martin, what did your mom say when Coldplay became popular? And he choked up. Because of all the years of sacrifice, traveling, songwriting, touring, his mom's thoughts were most important to him. Or the time I was in New Orleans, and I'm in this really cool, it's like a century-old mansion. And they said that the interview's on the second floor, I had to walk up this big staircase, just looking around. Well, I like this room. We sat down, and the first question I had for Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails, what was it like to visit Ground Zero weeks after 9-11? And he choked up. Very intelligent man, makes thick, industrial, angry music. But he was very human. And he said it was the most humbling experience of his life. Or the time when um, I'm in New York City, <laughs> and I'm with my producer, Jeff, and the interview is in this really cool suite. And I'm sitting on the couch, the door opens, seconds later, one of my heroes, rock legend Bono, right beside me. What? <laughs> and I said to him, very much like right now, you know, it's a real honor, I'm a big fan, kind of nervous, and you know what, I just don't want to sound like an idiot. And he looked at me and said, it's all right, man. We talk to idiots all the time. <laughs> and I choked up, because my theory in high school is I loved radio. My theory in high school is I love music. The reality of the fact that that kid in second year who stuck his hand as high as he could when the Edge music director said, does anyone want to work part-time in the music department? Are you kidding? That's not a reality I would ever have predicted. My college professor, I remember the first day of college, and he's, just imagine 30 kids. We've just decided we're going to be in radio. What do we do now? And my professor got up and said, if you think you're going to leave college and work in a big market, forget it. That's about as rare as being the lead in a Hollywood film. Not going to happen. You're going to work in small markets. You're going to make no money. You're going to pay your dues. I did not see this in the pamphlet. <laughs> Where is this in the marketing collateral? My first job at the Edge was cleaning records. For four months, every day after school, took the bus. Final, final records. There must have been 10,000. And I didn't think I was paying my dues. I was in radio. I was working at my favorite radio station. I was proving everyone, everyone wrong, including my professor. And my parents said, stick your head down, work hard, and all your work will pay off. <laughs> Seemed like it was working. So my reality changed, all my theory stayed the same. And over the next seven years, I tried everything. I was on the air, I wear promotions, marketing, went to shows. My professor said, not going to happen. Proved him wrong. My parents said, work hard. Proved them right. Theory, work hard. And that whole thing about that kid cleaning records became the theory of that step you need to take to get to the next step. It's like paying your dues. Because you don't graduate university and become the vice president. And even when you become the vice president, you still got to do more things. So that cleaning the records, working hard, keep at it. You know, it's, uh, every time I think of this, I'm in the room, and it happened years ago. Um, it was 11 o'clock on a Monday morning, and uh, one of my colleagues asked me to go see the boss. Walked in, the boss said, we're making some budget cuts, and your position has been eliminated. That changed my reality. Worked hard, head down. My professor said it would take 20 years. And it wasn't a job, it was a love affair. And it was done. It was like the love of my life had just broken up with me. And I had to make a decision. Was my theory about loving radio, or was my theory loving the edge? And I realized my theory was loving radio. So I went and got another job. About uh, six weeks later, a manager from about 90 minutes from my house offered me a part-time job. You're going to have to work weekends, overnights. Will you take it? I said, yeah. Clean the records. 
Put your head down, work hard. Three months after that, the music direct director resigned. I got his gig, and over the next three years, you know, love of your life, the pain went away. Because I have a whole new adventure. It's working again. Put your head down, clean the records, and it'll be rewarded. Three years into that gig, I get wind that The Edge wants to talk to me again. They're looking for a music director. And it was like the love of my life had called back. What? Why would they want to talk to me? They fired me. They dumped me. And over the next eight years, my career exploded. I was running the music department, Edge Fest, Casby Music Awards, New Rock Show, and I was flying all over North America talking to rock bands. Fifteen years after that kid left school, cleaned records, put his head down, and I'm sitting next to Bono? And I have a suspicion, because the theme today is from theory to reality. Think of your life right now. It's all, there's a bunch of realities. Now put a list down in your mind. How many of those realities turned out exactly how they were when they were theories? Not many. But you have to keep at it. And after that, the company asked me to launch another radio station. <laughs> Brand new opportunity. We put our head down, cleaned the records, put in the time. Two years after that, another company asked me to do that. And that one, I worked in a hotel room for four months, brought everyone into town, put together the team. We launched on the 26th of December, 2005. My reality was changing, but my theory stayed the same. Work hard, clean the records, keep at it. 51 weeks later, my boss walked in. Two minutes later, there's a check on my desk. Nothing personal. Your contract hasn't been renewed. Sorry. And you know they say that it's business, don't take it personally. It's your life. It's your work. Take it personally. Take it very personally. And you know business should do it. Because business doesn't give you uh, time to work on yourself, time to be personal. It's keep it at it, grind it out. And my theory of working hard had not become enough. And I like to say that on the 2nd of January, 2007, I sat in my home office and said, I'm a consultant now, and the phone rang. No, no, because I didn't have any records to clean. I didn't know what records I was cleaning. I didn't know what I was offering. I didn't know how to look for clients. I had no idea what I was doing. I guess I'll just work hard. I just guess I'll work harder. Lots of months with no paycheck. And over the last nine years, I've worked with some interesting clients. But I'm going through another transition right now. And, uh, you know, I've thought about three theories. Three theories. Three theories. <laughs> One, relationships. We all have them. Coworkers, teammates, lovers, schoolmates. How's that relationship with yourself? How much time do you spend on working on yourself? What is that self-talk when you things go wrong? Because I know I got blown out twice. What, have I, what did I do wrong? How could I have done better? My theories were wrong. The reality's changing. I had no control. Would you let people talk to you like you talk to you? A show of hands. How many people work at least one hour a week, every week, without fail, on yourself? I didn't think so. Yeah, there's a couple people there. How many people here work every week, without fail, on your work or studies? Right? I'm of the belief that Business should actually let us work on ourselves. But it doesn't let us do that, does it? And if business played more attention to human beings, if they changed that theory, the reality would be more business would be more successful. <laughs> and so when you look at what does that mean to have a relationship with yourself? What does it mean to be authentic? It's pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> You've got to look in your emotional mirror and say, who am I? What do I stand for? And it takes a lot of bravery. But it's the most, relation, most important relationship you're going to have. Building a fence, that's physical labor. Writing a book, that's intelligent labor. Working on yourself, that's emotional labor. 
and it's the work you're going to do your whole life. And most of us haven't even started. I thought I was. I thought that kid cleaning records was working on myself. No. I thought I was. I thought I could just say, I'm a consultant, and I'll get clients. No. So that's one theory, is working on yourself, taking the time to respect yourself enough to work on yourself. So a show of hands, who wants to give it a shot? To work on yourself. Pay yourself first. Your accountant says pay yourself first. We don't pay ourselves first emotionally, do we? We have all kinds of time for everyone else, which leads me to my next theory, asking for help. I had friends who almost did an intervention. I almost drilled it through the back of my head. Not a successful person in history has ever done it on themsel uh, by themselves. Bono didn't do it by himself. Trent Reznor didn't do it by himself. Chris Martin didn't do it by himself. But I'm just going to do my consulting and I'm not going to bother anybody. I'll just keep cleaning those records. <laughs> and if you're one of, someone like me who says, well, I don't really like asking for help, get over yourself. Because everyone in this room has helped someone. And there's at least one person in your life, if they called right now, you can get your coat and leave right this second if they needed you. And asking for help is not easy. It takes a lot of bravery. It shows a lot of character. And imagine if you're in your house. Imagine if you're in your house. You're watching TV. And it's suddenly on fire. Would you sit there and watch the show and go, I really hope the fire department shows up soon. No, you'd call 911. It sounds so simple, but it's so difficult. Stick your hand in the air and ask for help. And the third theory, humility. I was working with a senior executive last year. Oh, she was amazing. She had about 100 direct reports in her, in her department. And she called me and she said, I've got this uh, presentation to do for senior leaders and I'm paralyzed. I have no idea what to do. I said, hold on. The conversation wasn't about that. You know, they say that you miss the two-foot putt on the Masters in the 18th hole. Why do we do that? Because we get ourselves in the way. So she had the foresight to ask for help and the humility to call me but she'd lost her way on that relationship with herself. So how do we do this? Show of hands, wanna work more on yourself? Anybody? No? You gonna ask for help? Show of hands, ask for help. Come on, ask for help. Get your hands in the air. Humility, I had this one backwards. It has nothing to do with arrogance. So be proud of what you do. Work on that relationship with yourself. And please, ask for help.